Hollywood, it's Art Linkletter's House Party. And now, here's the star of our show, Art Linkletter. Well, we have a nice group of people here from all over the country. As a matter of fact, the usher told me just before I came out on stage that uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, turn the lights on for a second. Where is Miss Turkey, who just was the representative of Turkey in the Miss uh, in the beauty contest in Long Beach? There she is. Hello, Miss Turkey. Uh, thank you. You from uh, Istanbul? East, oh, a lovely town, Istanbul, where east is east and west meets together in the beautiful Golden Horn and the Bosphorus. I was there a couple of years ago. Uh, we also have a guest today who is uh, going abroad very shortly. And I know you've all read and heard and admired the unselfish men who've gone overseas around the world from America to serve as medical missionaries. In fact, we've interviewed several of them on this show over the years. And uh, today you're going to meet uh, uh, a medical man, not a doctor, a doctor of dentistry. That's what he is. He's a doctor of dentistry. He's not a physician. And he's set up one overseas clinic and will soon establish another. And he's doing it out of his own pocket, which I think is just great. And he has some fascinating things to tell about what he did on the Isle of Madagascar and uh, what he's going to do in Nepal. He's leaving for there with his wife very shortly. Of course, there are lots of jokes about dentists. Remember the one about the woman who rushed into the dentist's office and said, Doc, I want a tooth pulled, and I don't want any anesthetic, because I'm in a hurry. And uh, the dentist said, you're pretty brave. Which tooth is it? And the woman turned to her husband and said, show him your tooth, Fred. <laughs> We Americans are always being told to see your dentist twice a year. And we can, and we should. But there are millions and millions of people in the world who never get to see a dentist in their entire life. And that's why a man like our guest right now is going overseas. Dr. Dorrance Anderson, ladies and gentlemen. Doctor. <laughs> Doctor and I are meeting for the first time right here now, aren't we, Doctor? That's right, Art. Uh, you, uh, where, where'd you go to school? Uh, I have a BS degree from the Iowa State University in 1941 and a DDS degree from the University of Minnesota in 1949. And, and how'd you happen to get the idea to go to some far off island like Madagascar off the coast of Africa? Did you run across it in a geography book or did somebody say you ought to go there? No, Art, my wife and I have sort of had in the back of our mind that perhaps with our health and with the conditions being and existing in our lives, such as do prevail, that perhaps we ought to take it upon ourselves to spread a little bit of America someplace else and perhaps a little bit of Christianity along with it. And we selected Madagascar, or Madagascar was selected for us. It happened to be an opening where we could go. Now, they don't have many dentists there. No, they don't, Art. Uh, very, very few. Perhaps one dentist for a half a million people or more. My goodness. Well, did the people get this for nothing? How did they know that you were available for tooth pulling and extracting and all the other things? Did it get around through the jungle tribes or what? You think we have a grapevine here? The grapevine in Madagascar uh, excels any grapevine I've ever seen. About 1952 or three, a small hospital was established uh, down on the southeast coast of Madagascar in the little town of Manambaro near Fort Dauphin by two physicians and uh, uh, people had been traveling uh, for miles to come there and uh, dentist arriving, they knew it before I was uh, uh, aboard really. Uh, well, if somebody came, would they be accompanied by their family or more people if they wanted the tooth fixed? Uh, that's true, Art. This, this was one thing that surprised us. Not only the whole family comes, but the whole town would come. Carrying one patient with uh, uh, a toothache, uh, appendicitis, uh, whatever the disease might be, they have to come and see what happens. The whole village would come right along with them. You'd look out and here would be 50, 100, maybe 200 people uh, that uh, might uh, come with one patient. So many of us feel that primitive people have naturally good teeth. Do they need dentistry? They certainly do. The idea that primitive man uh, had no dental problems is a fallacy. Uh, actually, uh, as up to, uh, as uh, of today in this country, uh, dental problems probably are the greatest disease of mankind. Now, we don't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the common cold would uh, uh, supersede uh, 
uh, dental decay and gum problems or periodontal problems as we call them. But they have them as well as we do, and it's entire fallacy that they don't have problems. Even the caveman had dental problems. What do the natives there want most from you? The native there wanted a gold te tooth as a sign of distinction right in the front of his mouth. Big gold tooth uh, right there. Big gold there. tooth, and that's the truth. I suppose that they did their own extractions, or they do primitively, don't they? They try to uh, treat themselves. They have a root from a tree called the Balahazu root that they attempt some dental treatment with. It stains their teeth a horrible dark uh, black stain. I did meet one man there that, uh, uh, to show you that they are clever also, where you don't have any uh, uh, monopoly on being uh, uh, dental, uh, dental uh, uh, craftsmen ourselves. This man was aged perhaps 30 years old and had lost his two anterior upper teeth. And somehow in his mind he had seen, he had uh, formed the idea, or he had seen somebody make a mold out of clay and uh, let it harden in the sun. Then he had the foresight to run a wire through this mold and melt some lead, pour the lead into the mold through the wire, let it harden, ligate it to his upper two other uh, approximating teeth, and I have pictures of the bridge. Uh, actually, it's pretty good. A homemade bridge. A homemade bridge right out of here. How do you like it? <laughs> now you're going to Nepal. Yes, Art, that's right. And World Exchange Brotherhood is helping send you World Brotherhood Exchange. It's the World Brotherhood Exchange, now headquartered in Thousand Oaks, California, under the Reverend Conrad Broughton. It's a group of Christian laymen who uh, want to go out and help these people to lift themselves by their bootstraps uh, of course, with the idea of spreading a bit of Christianity, but also to spread America, the thing that we need so much now. Nepal happens to be a country where the opportunity has opened and where, of course, the need is also very great. I have been to Kathmandu. Have you really? I have flown into Nepal, and you'll you? find it a fascinating and colorful place. Just recently opened up to anybody in the world because the military dictatorship which ran for 300 years and which kept the prisoners of the king and queen there has been overthrown. And you'll find these Tibetan people all wrapped up coming down from the, uh, the Himalayas and layer after layer after layer and they smell. You'll know them when they're coming. <laughs> and their faces are a cross between Eskimo and Indian and Chinese. They're, they're wonderfully nice people. And I think that you're doing just the kind of a job that America needs. Our congratulations to you, Doctor. Thanks for having me. The other day I heard about a woman in a bowling alley who was bowling first with one hand and then with the other. And the proprietor said, that's ridiculous. Why are you doing that? And she says, well, I don't care about bowling. I'm taking off weight. And first, I like to take a little off on this side. <laughs> Isn't that silly? Everybody does or says silly things from time to time. We picked a few people who have volunteered to tell us about things that have happened to them. And our first guest is Mrs. Mary Reynolds. What happened to you, Mary? I very carefully planted what I thought was a red bud. What's that, a little bush? A little tree. In your garden? In our yard. And what happened? Well, my husband took care of it for two years. And it finally came up. Beautifully. And what was it? Poison oak. <laughs> Thank you very much. And she's off from scratch. This gentleman here, would you tell us who you are? I'm Dan Goody Coons from Houston, Texas. What happened to you, Dan? Oh, some years ago, I was trying to get a woodchuck uh, out from under a granary. That's the same thing as a groundhog. And uh, I had a trap on the animal's leg, and I... Couldn't get him out, he was wedged in there, so I reached in and got him by the tail and pulled him out, only it turned out to be a skunk. I'm glad you've changed since then. <laughs> well, there are two interesting and rather silly experiences. Your miss? Martha Ann Stevenson. Well, what had happened to you, Martha? Well, my family was taking a trip, and so it was a pretty long trip, and so my father unloosened his belt, and we stopped for lunch, and he got out of the car, and his pants fell down. <laughs> Pretty funny, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs> you are Mrs. Janet Anthony from Sioux City, Iowa. What happened to you, Janet? Well, a few years ago, uh, some friends of ours were caught in a flash flood, and we helped them uh, get out of the house. The father of the family was, of course, very calm. He was urging everybody to be calm, that we'd get out all right. He had everything packed for the family that we'd need for, they did, they'd need for the next few days. So uh, there was a tiny baby in the family and a grandmother over 90. 
I helped unpack the bag that he had uh, packed so well. And in were a silver fax, fox fur, a strip of barbecued ribs, my sister's girdle, and a one shoe. Now that's what happens when people get into a panic. They don't know what they're doing. This gentleman is Mr. Harold H. Stiles from Tucson, Arizona. What happened to you, Hal? Oh, when I was overseas in Brazil, I, I overstayed my pass and missed the bus back to camp, so I had to walk back about seven miles, and it was right on the beach, and I'd had a little bit to drink, so I walked back, and when I got opposite the MP headquarters, I had to get down on my hands and tummy and crawl for about a quarter of a mile through some thorn bushes. And I managed to pick up a few thorns, and the next day I woke up with a hangover and had to go to the hospital and get the thorns removed. Unfortunately, all they had was female nurses. So it was a little embarrassing to lay on my tummy with a hangover and have the thorns taken. Pulled out of your... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's a patio story, isn't it? Out of time, Jack, what do we have for our guests? All right, we have a 30-hour traveling alarm clock with a letter paid by Ed Thomas.